Hi, this is Greg Farshti. Welcome to the BS1 Podcast. I am here to give you guys some inside information if I can today, so I hope that you enjoy the show. Thank you, Greg. This is Krolix from Biosector01.com here with the BS1 Podcast. Today we'll be interviewing Greg Farshti, author of the Bionicle books, comics, and editor of the Lego magazine. Greg is a member of BS01 and BZPower.com and answers questions from us fans nearly every day. However, in the following interview, the BS1 staff are going to be digging a bit deeper beyond the surface, and we will see just how much we really knew about Greg before. Thank you so much for joining us, Greg. Oh, uh, you're welcome. I have Kairu here with me to start things off with the first question. All right. First question we have is, where did you grow up? Oh, well, um, I actually was born in New York State. I was born in a little town called Shrub Oak, and when I was two years old, we moved to Stamford, Connecticut. So most of my childhood was spent in Stamford, and then when I was 10, we moved to a town called Monroe in New York, which is in Orange County in New York, and I was there all the way through high school in the first two years of college. And then uh, when, I, when I went into junior year of college, my parents moved to a much smaller town called Narrowsburg, New York, which um, basically consists of a couple of streets, and um, the highlight of the year there was standing on the bridge over the Delaware River watching the ice break in the spring. Oh, wow. So that gives you an idea of how exciting and entertaining a, a town this was. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so you got to see quite a lot of places. How about, what is the first thing you remember being proud of writing? Um, well, I think the, uh, I think the thing I was probably the most proud of was, was my very first novel, River of God, because um, it was just so unexpected to get the opportunity to do it in the first place, and I had, you know, something like six or eight weeks to write 100,000 words, and, um, you know, it was uh, it was a marathon. I ended up finishing the book in like a 10-hour marathon wow. <laughs> uh, on, a, on a Sunday, uh, because I knew that um, I was killing virtually all the characters, and um, <laughs> I was going to miss them. So I, I kind of felt like, well, it's like, you know, have a splinter, you got to pull it out real fast, you know. So I just said, well, let's just sit down and let's just do this and let's just get it done. And that was probably the fastest I ever wrote anything. And um, I've had people tell me it was the most depressing thing that they ever read, which which I take as a compliment. So. Oh, cool. So, yeah, it would make sense to be proud of your first published novel because starting off a new career is the hardest point, right? Yeah. Prior to that, I had basically been doing newspaper reporting and, and sports writing and and it, it was great. It gave me a lot of experience. You know, I recommend it whenever I have somebody ask me about, oh, how do I become a writer? I always recommend journalism. But the hard part is that you're writing stuff, and it's relevant for that day, but the next day it's in the garbage. You mm -hmm. know? And it isn't going to really have an impact beyond the day it comes out. And when I went to West End Games, I got to start doing some, some game writing, and that was fun, uh, and it was creative. But the novel is just a whole other level of creativity, you know, and, and so it was a challenge because I remember, you know, when I was asked to do it, I didn't know if I could do it or not. I'd never written anything that long before, and um, it, was, it was a challenge, but it was a lot of fun. It was, it was definitely, it's, it's still a book I like to go back and read. That's neat. Yeah. Speaking of things you read, what kinds of things have you read? Well, most of what I read is nonfiction, actually, because I write fiction all week long. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I was young, um, I read a lot of Sherlock Holmes as a child. I read a lot of, uh, of comics. When I was in probably junior high, high school, I was reading a lot of horror uh, for a while there uh, and science fiction. And then um, really I would say the last several years I've been reading a lot of history, a lot of mythology, uh, a lot of folklore books, um, because all that stuff you can just sort of file away in the back of your head and you never know when you might be able to use something of it. For a story. I mean, when I wrote um, Hell's Feast, one of the characters in Hell's Feast was based on a, a mill pond spirit in Russian um, mythology. And actually, one of the characters I'm bringing into Bionicle very soon is also based on a Hungarian piece of folklore. Okay. So, you know, I, I use everything. Well, I have to ask, uh, where will that character show up? Can you say which it's, serial? It, it's going to be in uh, Samad's Tale. Okay, good. Uh, so obviously, you ended up writing, what other career paths did you consider growing up? 
Well, when I was a kid, uh, I wanted to be a lawyer, actually, and decided not to when I realized that I didn't want to defend guilty people. Uh-huh. And then uh, when I came out, I mean, I, I got a degree in communications in college, but um, really didn't have any idea where I was going to work because where I was going to be living, where my parents were, there was nothing. There was no place to work. There was no place to work within hours of where I was living. And I really didn't know what I was going to do. And um, I was initially sending out resumes for radio sales jobs because I had been working for the college radio station selling advertisements. And so that's I sort of started looking into that. Then I happened to see an ad for a local newspaper in the phone book, and I sent them a resume. And um, they never looked at it. They never looked at my writing samples. They just hired me because... I think the guy that had had the job before me was in jail or something, <laughs> and um, they were like, well, do you have a typewriter and you can bring it in? And I'm like, yeah, and they're like, okay, well, you can have the job then. Nice. And um, yeah, you had to bring your own typewriter in. It was really a, a top flight organization. <laughs> um, I ended up working there for about a um, year and a half, I guess, and then I, I quit in an ethical dispute because I had some and they didn't. <laughs> and um, ended up getting a job as a sports editor at another little paper, which actually was half the money, but they were a nicer bunch of people. And uh, that's where I learned how to do photography and develop film and uh, do layout. I mean, you did everything there, you know. So uh, sure. it was a seven-day-a-week job, but it was fun because you could schedule it well in advance. It's like you knew, okay, this Saturday I'm going to be at a football game. Okay, this Saturday I'm going to a soccer game. So you can actually plan your life a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I I enjoyed that, but I wasn't making any money. I was making like $7,000 a year uh, doing that. And my father finally came to me and said, you really need to get something where you're making like five figures. (laughs) (laughs) Right, sure. Hmm. Okay, well you definitely had a whole bunch of variation on the types of things that you at least got your feet into what were some of your big influences growing up in those oh well um i would say in in terms of my writing certainly the comics that i read had some influence i learned an awful lot uh, about writing from reading comics mainly in terms of dialogue and plotting and stuff like that i read a lot of ambrose bierce which i don't know if you're familiar with him he was a late 19th century satirist and i I learned a lot from reading him because i used to write a lot of humor when i was in high school he influenced me and uh i'm trying to think i can't think of too many other writers that that really uh, influenced me but i have you know i have some guys that i've read that their books are things that i treasure and still go back to um George MacDonald Fraser's Pirates book uh, is one that I read when I was young that I still uh, love to read. And most recently, Jasper Ford's book, The Fourth Bear, which is a marvelous retelling of the story of the three bears, is, is one that I've really enjoyed. And, and, you know, that's the thing. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time now, but you still get influence. You'll still read stuff and either go, wow, that was really good, or you'll go, wow, I wish I could write like that. You know, right. um, and I think the best way, really one of the best ways to learn to write is to read people who are better than you are, because you may never be as good as them, but at least you will aspire to it. If you're just reading stuff that's, just, you know, the same kind of thing or not as good, and you're kind of reading it because you're like, oh, well, I'm better than that, you're never going to get any better. You have to read people that are really good. So if I sit down to read like a mystery... I'll go read Jeffrey Deaver because Jeffrey Deaver can write rings around me. Um, <laughs> I mean, I just, I love his writing. It doesn't feel written. It feels like he's just sitting and talking to you. And I wish I could write like that. And I wish I could plot like that. But I don't write the same way he does. And he doesn't write the same way I do. But I, I, I'll read that and I'll be like, I want to go right now because I want to someday be as good as that. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how you got started out at Lego. Okay. Uh, well, essentially, I was looking uh, for a job in Connecticut. I was living in Pennsylvania at the time. I had interviewed for a couple of things. I interviewed to write corporate newsletters at Travelers, and uh, I'd applied for a whole mess of stuff. And um, I happened to be on a web, a job website, and um, saw an ad for a, um, a Lego Club writer. And at the time, I had no idea what the Lego Club even was. And so I sent in, and um, they had not at that point asked for writing samples. So I sent the resume in and, you know, didn't hear anything. And then I happened to find the the ad again, and this time they were asking for writing samples. So I called them up, and I said, well, do you want a writing sample? And they're like, oh, yeah. So I sent something in, 
and because uh, I'd done some writing for highlights for children and, and stuff when I lived in Pennsylvania. I called them up like three weeks later. They, you know, they hadn't gotten in touch, and I said, uh, I'm just following up. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're the one who you sent the writing sample, and you're one of the few who did what we wanted. <laughs> so I went over to Connecticut, and I, I interviewed pretty much all day and went back, and another three weeks went by. And I called up, and I said, well, you know, what's the deal here? And they're like, oh, yes, we need you to go to New York and interview in our New York office. Uh, with the web team, so I went down there and I spent the day down there, and then uh, came home and they they called me up and offered me the job, and um, I relocated. I think oh, a few weeks, maybe three weeks later, I moved into Connecticut and started the job, and I will have been there ten years in October. Wow, very cool. Now that you're working at Lego, can you describe for us what a day at work would be like? A typical day, um, get in probably between 8.30 and 9 uh, after I drop my wife off at work. On a normal day, uh, I usually have a few meetings. Um, most of my meetings are with brand managers to discuss content for the magazine. Sometimes there will be something more fun than that, like um, seeing some of next year's sets and brainstorming names for them, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, you do it with some writing, um, usually for the magazine. Also, we do it, we have a thing called Webproof, which is uh, a web site where we post the, the pages for the magazine, and we can look at them there, make corrections, and send them on back to the art department. So, when it's busy, which it has been for the last few weeks, you'll get Webproofs coming in, you know, every 10 minutes. So, whatever you're working on, you basically have to stop and go do that, and uh, it, it can make it hard to get stuff finished sometimes. I work from home one day a week because if I have major, major stuff that needs to be written that I really need to be able to concentrate on, it's a lot easier to do it here. And yeah, pretty much, you know, it's, it's, it's meetings and, um, and proofing and whatever writing I can manage to fit in. And then occasionally we'll get a special project, like we, we recently did a big project for Hero Factory. We did a project for Universe. We did, uh, my, my staff writer does a lot of work on animation. Uh, he does a lot of the writing for the stop motion animations that we do, and so he's well, about half his time is taken up doing that probably. So that's that's pretty much you know the normal day is pretty much being in the office all day. Okay, so now we have some Bionicle related questions. Do you have a favorite memory writing specifically for Bionicle? Um, I would probably say Time Trap. People always ask me what was my favorite book, and that was my favorite book, and it was because I knew what I wanted to do with it. I didn't have to try to match, you know, a, a, a story bible because it was sort of an um, intercession book. Uh, I knew what I wanted to do. I was going to only have to deal with a few characters, and I wasn't at all sure that I could do it. I wasn't at all sure I could pull the book off. And when it was finally finished, I was just so happy with the way that it turned out, and I still think it's probably one of the best ones uh, of all of them. There was some stuff, you know, early on that I, I, I was really... I liked... Um, Voyage of Fear, that was one other one that I liked. It, I, it was generally the ones that were sort of the bridge books, where it wasn't like the one where, the, where we flash back to the Paracas history, you know. Right. Anything that wasn't really part of the main story for that year, where I was just getting to play and have fun, were probably the things I enjoyed the most. It's definitely understandable. What would you say was the hardest part? The hardest part of writing for Bionicle was probably the fact that you had so many characters that you had to work in. You know, you had, you know, 25, 30 characters a year, and you're trying to give them all some kind of screen time, and there's just no way to do it. Even with the books, there was just no way to give everybody equal screen time. So some people just fade in the background, and you're kind of left with going, well, why do we even have these characters if we're not going to do anything with them? And occasionally you'd have, you know, like back when we were in, I guess it was 2002, with the Exotoa, I was told, well, don't really do anything with them. You know, we, we don't, you know, the, the guy who was running the story team at the time just really didn't like them that much and didn't want me to do anything. And it's like, well, so they, they sort of got five minutes of screen time and then I had to get rid of them. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you had to, a lot of times, I mean, it was, some of it was fun because it was a challenge if they'd come and go, well, you know, you need to have, you know, focus on this character this month and you kind of have to change the story to do that. But I think just having to introduce so many characters every year and, you know, make them all interesting and, and, and cram so many of them into the storyline was hard. Um, and I think that's why, you know, you do get people complaining about the lack of characterization. And it's basically because you've got 25 characters and a limited amount of space. Right. And it's just not 
possible with you know 20,000 words a book to give them all equal time and you end up just focusing on a handful of them yeah what would you say was the most rewarding moment in your entire involvement with Bionicle hmm I think my most rewarding moment was in I think it was 2003 or 2004 it was the first Comic Con that I went to I had come back from lunch and there was a, a family there that were from California and they had come to the con to, to meet me and the uh, little boy was um, autistic he had Asperger's syndrome mm. and he was pretty much just you know watching the video games and stuff like that he was kind of just focused on that and his mother was telling me that he just totally was in the Bionicle he knew every word of everything I'd ever written this was just his thing and she was so happy because he had been able to make friends at school because he was into something the other kids were into you know she was just they really had wanted to meet me and they were so glad that they hadn't missed me and all this other stuff and I spent a lot of time talking to her then I had to go back to work and as they were leaving the little boy came running over and gave me this big hug and uh -huh. autistic kids don't generally do that right. you know with somebody that they don't even know and uh, we ended up staying in touch. I am actually still friends with his mom. And uh, we used to exchange Christmas cards and gifts and everything every year and, and pictures. And I'm still, you know, kind of keep up with him through his mom. And, and um, that was really a wonderful moment. I mean, I can still remember the plane taking the plane home that night and just feeling so thrilled that, uh, you know, something I had done had touched this kid and had made life better for this kid wow. and um that was one of the best things about bionicle really uh, above, above everything else is that i got to meet so many fans yeah. i got to meet so many people that were into it because a lot of the people you know everybody at lego is really nice and they're really passionate about lego and passionate about wanting to put out a good product but a lot of them don't get the chance to ever meet consumers. They don't get to meet the kids that buy the sets. They don't get to meet the people that are into it. I had this, this good fortune to get to meet hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of Bionicle fans over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and it was incredibly rewarding and uh, something that I really wouldn't have traded for anything. And I think something that, that really uh, was a benefit that I had that a lot of the people I work with did not get to have. Yeah, wow, that's really cool. I'm glad we got to talk about that story. Yeah, that is great. You know, you got to see the the entire legacy of what you created in Bionicle, but everything has a beginning and an end. So could you explain for us, to, like, describe the beginning and the end of Bionicle? Well, uh, I don't know that much about the beginning because uh, I wasn't working there at the time. I, I came on board in um, the very end of 2000, and at that point they were getting ready for the launch of the, the line. So one of the first things that they had me do was read the story Bible, and the main thing I remember from that was getting to the end and going, you're going to end it after a year? You're waking up Mata Nui after a year? I said, this, this thing has so much potential. This could be such a big de thing. You know, it's so incredibly interesting. Why would you want to end it after a year? You know, getting the chance to do the comic was a big deal for me because I didn't expect to get to do it. And, um, you know, of course, 2001, 2002 was such a big thing. I mean... It sold so much better than we expected it to, and it was so so incredibly hot for us at the time, and uh, it was just nice to be involved with something that was so popular, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, I, I have to say there were you know there were more than a few times over the course of the ten years that we thought it was going to end. Uh, I mean, prior to the rock sheet coming out in 2003 all we were hearing from the retailers is well this is dead and we're not interested in this anymore and you know whatever and it was really the rock sheet coming out that that saved bionicle that time and it had a lot of ups and downs it had a lot of ups and downs i mean it had years when the marketing budget was cut and so then the sales would go down and you know there were a lot of different times that we weren't sure what was going to happen with it there were a lot of times that you know uh the story team was really arguing about stuff and it was just wasn't pleasant to be a part of and um and there were other times, especially the last few years, when um, we, you know, I would be in a room with uh, with uh, Christian from our uh, ad agency and um, Christopher, who was our set designer, and we would just be riffing off each other, coming up with story stuff, just building on each other's ideas, and it was just enormous fun. They were great people to work with, and um, the ending was very abrupt. Uh, we had actually gone over for a meeting to discuss the uh, 2000 
10 movie, essentially to review the screen treatment that I'd written uh, before we passed it on to uh, the studio. Right. And, you know, I had flown to Denmark for the meeting, and we were talking about it, and we were, like, bashing ideas around before the meeting started. And then the meeting started, and the uh, franchise manager said, well, you know, the decision's been made that um, we're going to end this after 2009, and uh, we're not going to do the second movie, and we have to come up with, you know, another line to take its place. And um, it was it was quite a, a shock for me, and uh, it took a long time for me to get over it. I mean, it was something I'd been so intimately involved with and, and really had lived and breathed so much that it was very hard to, uh, to say goodbye to it. Yeah, um, I'm sure. I didn't really completely understand the reasoning at the time, and, and um, uh, it was just very, very upsetting for me. And um, I'm glad that I'm still getting to do the serials, even though it's sometimes hard to work them in my schedule, but I'm glad I'm still getting to do them. And the fact is that even if they hadn't done them, I probably would have found some way to do something on BZ Power if the company would have let me to keep doing some kind of story, because I, I, you know, I, I didn't, wasn't ready to let it go yet. Right. Okay. I'm definitely thankful for that. Very true. Okay, we have just one more question here for you today, Greg, uh, and that mm -hmm. is, what's in your future? Well, uh, one of the things that's in my future is a baby. Yay! Yes, my, <laughs> my, uh, my wife and I are expecting our first child in September. That's so cool. Uh, which is part of the reason that I've told a few people, well, you know, I may not be able to help you out with this project because I may be way too busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm still, you know, involved with the magazine, the website, Club TV, all the other things that Club is doing. Um, and uh, I've done a little bit of writing for Hero Factory, not too much yet. I've been doing a little bit of stuff for the uh, Polish uh, publisher, Ami, that's done some of the Bionicle books. And I've gotten to do a little bit of, of original uh, fiction for them, which was okay. The stuff I've been doing for Lego has largely been just adaptations of the story Bible or adaptations of, other, of stuff other people have written. So I haven't really gotten to be too creative uh, with any of that yet. I actually sent, I had done a little, a little diary entry for one of the villains uh, for the Polish company and got a very nice email. I'm like, oh, this is really good. Oh, we really feel like we know him now. And I'm like, I'm going to get some characterization into this if it kills me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm doing some work on that. And then um, we have another line coming out in um, 2011 that I'm hoping to have some involvement with. I think the story, the overall story is probably already pretty much written, but I'm hoping to, you know, be involved with it on a club level, uh, at least, and um, uh, we'll see how that goes. I mean, that's something that the company's very excited about, so hopefully it'll have some legs. All right, well, definitely uh, congratulations on the baby news. That's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So before we let you go here, Greg, I just wanted to give you the chance to say anything that you wanted to to the Bionicle fans listening. Well, I think the main thing I'd like to say is just to say thank you for... Uh, you know, 10 years of being so passionately involved in this. I mean, um, it was really the fans that made Bionicle a bigger thing than just a toy line. When it ended, the analogy I used with a lot of kids was Star Trek. And I basically said, you know, once Star Trek ended, the network didn't care about it anymore. Nobody cared about it anymore. And it was the fans that kept it alive until finally somebody turned around and said, well, you know what? There's a whole mess of people out there that like this. Let's do something with it again. You know, and it was... You know, it was a lot of years. A lot of years went by before that happened. But if the fans shrug their shoulders and they're like, I don't care about this anymore and I'll just forget about it, then everybody else is just going to forget about it too. Mm -hmm. So the only people, you know, Lego Company really can't do it. The only people that can keep the flame alive is the fans. And if the fans keep it alive, who knows? Maybe it'll come back someday. You know, maybe, maybe somebody at Lego will look at that and go, well, you know what, there are still people that love this, that still care about this, and there's still a market for it, and, um, you know, maybe we can we can do something with it again someday. And, and that, you know, it, it's a lot of responsibility, and it's a load, um, but, um, but it's something only fans can do. Right. Uh, and that's why I'm still on the site answering questions. That's why I was willing to keep doing the serials and uh, all that sort of thing, because that's my contribution to, to that. Um, I figure I can't ask you guys to do it if I'm not willing to do it. But, you know, that's that's really going to be up to, to all the people, not only the people on, on your site and BZ Power and the other Bionicle fan sites, but the kids who aren't on fan sites. The kids who are out there 
writing stories and drawing pictures and coming up with their own Toa and all that sort of thing. They're the ones that are going to keep this thing alive and maybe someday be able to buy it for their own kids. Well said. Okay, well, thank you very much again for joining us on the show. Take care, Greg. Say